Many thanks to all who are joining us remotely and or in spirit as well, including the Felician sisters, our Olsh faculty and staff members, and other friends and family who are on hand for the 2020 Distinguished Alumni Awards Program. My name is Terry Donahue, and I have the blessing and honor of serving as president of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart High School. Today, we celebrate the essence of the transformative Catholic education offered to students at Olsh, and that is forming outstanding alumni who make a difference in our world and in a noteworthy way possess hearts of Olsh as they do it. At this time, I would like to invite you to join with me as I officially open our event with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving God, Please bless all those gathered here today as we come together in friendship and fellowship. Thank you for the blessings of our individual and collective God-given gifts. Place in our hearts the desire to make a difference to our families, to our community, to our country, and to the many cultures and peoples worldwide. Give us balance in times of distraction and uncertainty. Help us move toward our goals with determination and always with an abundant sense of humor. Thank you for food in a world where many only know hunger, for our faith in a world where many know fear, for friends in a world where many know only loneliness. Please bless this food we are about to share those who prepared it, those who serve it, and those who have worked to make today the special occasion that it is. For all of this, we give you thanks. Amen. Our Lady of the Sacred Heart, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Please enjoy this very festive brunch and the time we spend together today. Members of our food service staff and or Phoebe will uh, let you know when it's your turn to go to the buffet table. And finally, welcome home. Thank you.
everyone here and to everyone joining us virtually from home. My name is Phoebe Christek, and I am the Manager of Alumni and Parent Engagement at Olsh. I'll be serving as your MC for today's awards ceremony, although I do think that two of our guests would be better at that than I would be, but <laughs> this is our fourth year honoring Olsh graduates with Distinguished Alumni Awards in this special format. Although it is a bit different this year from years past, we are blessed to be able to spend the morning celebrating together. Many of your former teachers wanted to be with you today to celebrate your accomplishments, but due to event capacity restrictions, were unable to attend. I do know that Mr. Jack Mahalo especially wanted to be here, but he's excited to be tuning in safely from home. He does extend his well wishes to each of you today. The alumni we honor today were nominated by their classmates and peers, teachers, family members, or friends. Our Olsh Distinguished Alumni Awards Committee took the time to review over 40 nominations in order to determine this year's honorees. The Olsh alumni community stands at over 3,500 individuals, and we have always known that our graduates are in the world doing great things and making a great impact. Each year, we discover more about the extent of their achievements as we vet the nominees for awards. Without question, they continue to surprise and impress us, and we enjoy celebrating and recognizing their accomplishments. The men and women you will hear about this morning have taken the academic, spiritual, and moral education supplied to them by Olsh and the Felician sisters and put their formation into action. They are Christian leaders who live out Olsh's mission and serve as role models to the entire Olsh community. It is my privilege to help honor the four of them today. Let us begin with our Young Alumnus Award. The Olsh Distinguished Young Alumnus Award honors an Olsh alumnus under the age of 35 who has distinguished themselves in professional achievements. I would like to introduce to you Mr. Evan Axelbank, who will say a few words about Haley Hines, class of 2004, this year's Young Alumnus Award recipient. Um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hines, Jordan and Megan, everyone from Our Lady of Sacred Heart, including Principal Mr. Plotnick, uh, excuse me, Plosnick, who I understand knows what it's like to have Haley as a student, and also Sister Francine, who had so much fun being principal to the Hines siblings that she figured it would be even more fun to become a math teacher here. So, The other three honorees as well, congratulations to all of you. And to everyone here, it's great to be with you today. It's wonderful to be here spending time together after such a difficult summer, difficulties that continue for many families, we should think about the people who can't be here with us today. I am Haley's husband, Evan, also a reporter at Fox 13, so I know what it's like to see Haley in many places, in many circumstances. And it's so great and appropriate that you're honoring her because Olsh, which I hear about all the time, is where her journey in journalism and in life started. It was here where she did morning announcements and participated in the newspaper. I can think of no better smiling face to start your day with than Haley Hines. And believe it or not, she still makes the morning announcements every day at home. How wonderful it is for Jordan and Haley to have this wonderful school to come back to and to know that you're always by their side and that their accomplishments here will represent success to current and future students. You helped make Haley into who she is today, and hopefully her example will light the way for others to give to the world knowledge, information, kindness, and joy. Those things are all needed desperately now, and to honor my wife is to honor those things. She loves you all so much and is so appreciative of this wonderful moment. So please welcome the woman who I honor every day, Haley Hines.
Thank you so much, Evan, for that wonderful introduction. He, he has heard stories of Osh for years. Anytime he comes home, looks across the valley, sees the school. We've gone for runs here. He definitely has a couple t-shirts in his drawers, so it's only appropriate that he can finally come here and see the school and, and meet so many of the people that make it such a wonderful place. Um, also, thank you. Thank you to Osh. Thank you to President Donahue and everyone who put so much work into making this day happen under difficult circumstances. I know it wasn't easy, but uh, I'm really excited to be back. It's certainly been a while. I, I actually think the last time I was inside the building, I was interviewing Sister Francine. It was my uh, the summer before my sophomore year in college, and I was, I was volunteering at Moon Community Access Television. We were talking about the uh, renovations here. Um, so she was a wonderful interview. <laughs> it made it easy for, uh, for a young person just learning. But I will always be grateful for the, uh, the life-changing experience and education that I had here at Olsh, and for the chance to come back to a place that always feels like home. It was, it was special to hear that welcome home at the beginning of this today. Um, walking through the campus and through the hallways, um, so many special memories come back. It doesn't seem like it was that long ago that we were listening to the Clarks in Mr. P's study hall or uh, making basketball signs in the AAC or, or making clown costumes with Sister Mel for Clown Troop uh, or, or learning the history of the Titanic with Mr. Brasco because he's that kind of guy. Um, but reading the stories of the other three alumni here today was incredibly humbling to be part of this group. Uh, a doctor in philosophy and physics, published in scientific journals, uh, former classmates, a religion teacher and co-founder of a missions organization, a former teacher, one of my former teachers who works tirelessly for the Felician Sisters, spreading their good work and their good news, and, and someone who I've actually called for guidance on a story not too long ago. Um, we've all taken different paths in life, but we share one thing in common. Olsh has helped thousands of students just like us build foundations for happy, strong, successful, faith-filled lives. And, and as Evan mentioned, uh, my journey into journalism and TV news started right here at Olsh. It was pretty neat walking past that door with WCHR on it. Uh, WCHR gave me my first opportunity to anchor a newscast and, and produce a show. And some of my fondest memories are from those mornings putting the announcements together with Miss Desmond helping us prepare the show and Mr. Mahalo, hi there, <laughs> I heard you were watching, Mr. Mahalo standing by to help us with any technical troubles that we might run into. And it was in those early days that I learned the importance of troubleshooting and getting the show on the air no matter what. And that is a lesson that uh, still benefits me today. So even before I committed to majoring in broadcast journalism in college, the school gave me a chance to try it out and to realize that this was more than just a morning activity that was kind of fun to do before classes. This was a passion that I wanted to pursue as a career for the rest of my life. And it's been an exciting adventure from Walsh to Waynesburg to Syracuse, New York, to Fort Myers, Florida, and, and finally Tampa, um, where we live and where we just bought our first home. Uh, little did I know that I would end up in Florida. I always thought I'd be back here in Pittsburgh, but I'm so thankful for Ms. Abbott, Ms. Fay, and four years of excellent Spanish classes because that base knowledge of the Spanish language has benefited me in so many ways, personally and professionally there. Um, just like the students here, working in journalism is like going to school every day, and that's one reason why I'm so passionate about it. You learn about the world, how it works, the people who live there, their problems, their greatest accomplishments, and it really is a daily lesson in the human condition, and we help other people understand that too. Um, the stories that I've covered as a reporter have given me a front row seat to some of life's most thrilling, fascinating experiences. I've hung out with people like Magic Johnson. I've flown around in aerobatic planes and felt 4Gs in the back of a fighter jet and jumped out of a perfectly good Army airplane twice in a day. And those are the great days. Those are the days where you go, I can't believe this is my job. Um, but that's just a fraction of what we do, because reporters also do get front row seats to life's most heart-wrenching, real experiences. You know, I've, I've interviewed and, and cried with countless families who were grieving the sudden, senseless loss of a loved one. I've actually witnessed the execution of a man who took the life of a police officer, and 
sat shoulder to shoulder with that officer's family. Um, I've attended far too many vigils for people pleading for justice that may never come. But without faith, you know, it's hard to get through those days and, and process what you've seen. Thankfully, that faith was solidified here at Olsh. Now, years after graduating, I still carry those lessons with me every single day. And while it would be a wonderful opportunity for anybody to work at a, a Christian or Catholic focused media outlet, I found that as a Catholic journalist, you really can live out your faith, no matter what station or newspaper you're working at. You live it in how you treat the people you meet with dignity, you, how you speak to them, the compassion that you show them, the people who are going through their absolute worst moments in life, and we really see a lot of them. You know, it's okay to tell people you're interviewing that you can pray with them, that you're praying for them. You can live out your faith by pitching faith-centered stories that maybe are easily overlooked or shining light on the issues of those in need who feel like they've been treated unjustly. You live it in the words that you carefully choose to say or write. And something as small as wearing ashes on Ash Wednesday, I've found, is, is a great way to use our platform to educate. Not everybody knows, and it's okay to share your faith with people uh, on a larger scale. You know, journalists can even live out their faith in responding peacefully when people aren't always kind. Uh, now more than ever is a time when the world needs good journalists, and they may be working over at WCHR right now, and it's exciting that, that this will be the place where they find that passion. And each day we are faced with stressful situations, moral and ethical decisions to make, choices over the right words to say, write, or tweet. Um, but thanks to the teachers and staff here, the Felician sisters, the coaches, and all the people who take the time to help students grow in heart and mind, those tough decisions are never really that difficult because we learn the answers early uh, right here on Woodcrest Avenue. So uh, thank you again for having me here today and congratulations to all my fellow alumni. <laughs> Congratulations, Haley. The Olsh Distinguished Alumnus with Heart Award honors an Olsh alumnus who exemplifies one or more of the Felician core values, respect for human dignity, compassion, transformation, solidarity with the poor, and justice and peace, and maintains a strong connection to Olsh. At this time, I would like to introduce Mr. Tim Plosnick to introduce Dina Swank, class of 1992, our Alumnus with Heart Award recipient. Morning, everyone. Um, first off, I would like to congratulate Danny Gallagher, um, Haley, and, um, and Mike Havoc, and um, you know, I, I just want you guys to know I have such, such really good, such fond memories of all of you. Um, and I'm just so proud of where you've gone in your life and what you've accomplished in your life and, and just so impressed that, you know, you, you continue to not only represent Olshwell, uh, but the Felician Sisters especially, and you've taken the lessons with you. So congratulations to all of you and well-deserved on the awards you're receiving today. Um, it's truly an honor, it really is, to have been asked to introduce Dina um, as a recipient of the uh, Alumnus with Heart Award. Um, when you were going through the values, Phoebe, um, you know, you have to have at least one value. She, she checks all the boxes, all the boxes. And um, Dina's foundation, of course, was created at home with her parents and, and solidified here at Olsh through the Felician Sisters and the many sisters that she had in the classroom who look to inspire their students to love Jesus Christ and to put their faith into action through service. And Dina's return to Olsh as an English teacher and in the advancement office provided her the opportunity to influence others. The person who was influenced um, by the Felician, system, Felician sisters became the influencer, so to speak, um, influencing the students uh, the faculty, staff, myself in particular, 
And I, I have to admit, though, um, being asked to, to introduce Dina is, is, a, is a bit of a challenge. Um, not that the topic is difficult, quite honestly. I mean, she is someone who bleeds purple and gold. She's always had the utmost respect for the Felician sisters, and she's come back to Olsh twice as a teacher and working in the advancement office. And um, her dedication to her students, uh, her dedication to their job and advancement has always been inspiring. And, and in short, she's shown her dedication, love, and passion for her alma mater, and has always been a champion of Olsh. So, so what's the challenge in writing an introduction? It's kind of embarrassing, to be honest with you. Um, when Dina worked in advancement, she wrote most of my monthly messages and, and scripts for speeches. Um, and uh, I didn't think it was right to ask Dina to actually write her own in, uh, you know, introduction. Steve, I almost reached out to you. Steve, go to Dina and say, hey, if I were introducing you, what would I, what would I say? Okay. Um, so... I didn't have Dina to write it, so I did the next best thing. I reached out to those who know her or knew her uh, for some comments, and I'm going to share those with you um, from former students, two of which are current English teachers at Olsh. Uh, talk about being an influencer. Um, Erica Flasco Hollaba. I can vividly remember having Ms. Newsom's class while school was being held at the Boyd Building during Olsh's renovation. We had great discussions over the literature pieces. She explained each piece to a point where you could truly relate to the material. I credit her with being the reason I am able to teach writing the way I do so today. She set high expectations for her students and made sure you understood the ins and outs of thesis statements, citations, and textual evidence, aspects I try to emulate in my own classroom. Great influence. From Rachel Adams Wallover, again, another English teacher. My favorite thing about Mrs. Swank was her ability to perfectly balance professionalism, compassion, and sarcasm. And anyone who knows Dina knows sarcasm. She was always exactly the version of Mrs. Swank you needed her to be, if that makes sense. If I ever came to her with a problem, I knew she would take me seriously and offer whatever help she could. If, I were, if, if we were ever joking around the class, we knew she would joke along right along with us until it was time to get serious again. She also treated everyone in her class like we had infinite potential, regardless of our varying degrees of literary perspicacity, which, by the way, was one of their uh, vocab words that she learned from your class. I have no idea what it means. As teachers, I think we're made up of many things including the influence of those who came before us. Mrs. Swank was a positive influence in my life when I was in her classroom, and that influence has now carried over to my own classroom. Again, powerful influence. And a third uh, person who knows her, Kai Plosnick Rapp, my daughter. Now, my daughter is typically short and to the point, and she was here as well. Hard not to appreciate someone dripping with sarcasm, but a brilliant teacher. My daughter, by the way, is now the grammar Nazi in her office, and she credits her Olsh education uh, for her being able to do that. I didn't see it coming. I don't know if you did, but I didn't see it coming. Um, and, and lastly, uh, in this sense, from hearing from other people, from her good friend, Jennifer Riley, who could not be here today. Jennifer writes, Sister Jana, along with three other Olsh teachers, organized and supervised a mission trip that 12 students, including me and Dina, made to the Caritas Mission in Frenchville, Pennsylvania. Over the course of our stay, our assignments included visiting the homes of senior residents and completing tasks that range from household chores to yard work, visiting a home for people with disabilities, and helping job seekers improve resumes and letter writing skills. Each evening when we were returned to the mission center, the reflections that we shared about these experiences didn't focus on manual tasks. We all felt deeply impacted in getting to know the people we were serving and the true joy we found in the conversations and time that we were privileged to spend with them. Afterward, Dina and I were asked to write an article about our experience for the Pittsburgh Catholic. 
Drafting and redrafting the article, I remember being struck by the careful consideration Dina gave to every detail. And now, taking from the article, Dina wrote, quote, most of us learned the same general lesson from this weekend. It taught us that poverty isn't just a lack of material things, there is also a poverty known as loneliness. Some of these people are poor in the sense that they lack the companionship that we often take for granted. We learned that sometimes an understanding and compassionate ear is worth more than any amount of physical labor. This type of poverty exists not only in Appalachia, but also throughout the world. Dina concluded our reflections with the following. We knew the friends we made, excuse me, we knew the friends we made and the people we served would always be part of our lives. They touched our hearts in a special way and we can only hope that we have touched theirs. Such profound words coming from such a young person. Jen goes on to conclude saying, I love looking back on that day nearly 30 years ago and seeing how my dear friend has turned her passion for empathetic communication and helping others into her life's work as an advocate for the Flesh and Sisters of North America to help sustain their mission. She is someone whom I truly admire and who continues to inspire me. I can't think of anyone more deserving of this honor, and, and I agree wholeheartedly. You know, in working in advancement for Olsh, aside from being my ghostwriter, Dina was tasked with developing and enhancing alumni relations, something she both had, had both a passion and a flair for doing. And whether it was reaching out to alums who had graduated years ago, say 1992 or maybe even earlier, um, or, uh, I lost my place here, excuse me, or, or addressing a graduating class at a commencement ceremony, Dina had a way of making them feel that they're valued, they're appreciated, and certainly part of something bigger. In 2015, Dina welcomed the graduating class's alumni with a speech titled, How to Be a Good Alumnus, a sort of top 10 list of things to do. And the words this, uh, from this speech are the words that Dina continues to live by. So you did write part of the speech. Number one, come back and visit. Number two, keep in touch. Number three, let us know where you are. Four, reach out to other alumni. Five, speak well of us. Six, represent us well. Seven, pray for us. Eight, send your kids here. <clears throat> Nine, thank your parents again. <clears throat> and 10, Consider giving back. As an alum who I said uh, earlier bleeds purple and gold, Dina speaks well of our school, represents us so very well, and has spent her life giving back to Olsh and the Felician sisters in so many ways. And just going to keep working on that send your kids here thing, by the way. Okay. Last, there's one more thing about Dina that I, I'd really like to share. I have always truly appreciated how much she is concerned about my health and well-being. You know, being a principal is a very stressful position, and if I wasn't feeling well or may have been overstressed, she would always ask if there's anything that she could do to help out, and, and I truly appreciate that. And um, when I turned 60 a couple years ago, uh, she was so concerned about my advanced aging that she helped create a special parking place uh, for me as close to the school as possible so that, you know, I wouldn't have to walk too far to the school, and she actually I was, took part in creating a special sign. Let me show you. My special sign. <laughs> it was nice. I held on to it. All that said, as I said earlier, I am truly honored to introduce my former student, colleague, and longtime friend, Dina, who is most deserving of the Alumnus with Heart Award. Congratulations.
Okay, thanks. See, that was a wild card. I think I was more nervous about what he was going to (laughs) say than what I was going to say. And I did think long and hard about what to say because there's so much to say. Um, The first year that this award was given, I nominated my best friend, who was Jen Riley, because to me, she was the embodiment of the award. Um, She was someone that I aspired to emulate. And no surprise, she won. And now here I am receiving the same award, and I can't even imagine being in her company in that wonderful class of people. Or being in the company of you know, Haley and Mike and Dan and all of the previous winners, because there is a rich, rich history with our alumni, and I got to see that firsthand. It's wonderful company to be in. As I was writing my comments, I realized that I had a great opportunity to thank two people that probably get way less recognition than they deserve, Um, the two people who have put up with my nonsense the most, the longest, um, and the two people who are the reason I'm here. My parents have made sacrifices. They have pushed me beyond my comfort zone and given me countless opportunities in life. And in 1988, they did it again. They put me on a a bus, and they sent me off to this little high school in Coriopolis. Probably I was kicking and screaming a little bit because, you know, my friends went to Canavan, and and that was the thing to do. But little did I know that Olsh would become such a huge part of my life. Um, Four years as a student, eight years as a teacher, another four years in alumni and parent relations, little bits in between where, you know, I was a stay-at-home mom kind of struggling and they would find little things for me to do here and there or I would be substitute teaching. Um, And now I've left and I am so blessed to work for the Felician sisters directly. Um, Being a teenager is hard. (laughs) It's hard academically, it's hard physically, it's hard emotionally, it's hard spiritually, it's hard socially, it's a minefield. And my God, I was blessed to be walking through that minefield here. I don't know how else to say it except I was known here. I knew my teachers, I knew my principal, I knew my vice principal, I knew my counselors, I knew my coaches, I knew the office staff. There was no hiding here. Someone always had their eye on me, for better or for worse. There was no hiding. And I had fun, you know. I'm fully versed in the special language that only Olsh grads can speak. You know, I, I, can, I know what penny wars and the low ceiling and the AAC and the social commons and the charger mart, I know what all of that means. And it means a lot. It means that my high school experience was an experience. It was full of laughter. It was full of fun. It was full of service. It was full of education. It was a comfort when I went through some of the hardest times in my life. Um, We lost a classmate during my sophomore year in a car accident. I don't know that that anywhere else would have been as more supportive than when they were here. We rallied because Olsh rallies. Then divine providence brought me back to be on the other side of the desk, divine providence and sister Francine. Um, And my teachers became my colleagues and my students became my kids. And as a young teacher, I don't think I appreciated the opportunity that I had, that Sister Francine had given me. You know, I was a young teacher. I had my eye on that holy grail of a public school position, you know, tenure and retirement plans and a paycheck. And, you know, in the beginning, that was, that was, this was a stepping stone. And the longer I was here, the harder it became to leave. 
you know, I was coaching volleyball. So I was here from July until August and then through the school year. I was here days, I was here nights, I was here weekends, and suddenly that just became the norm. I wouldn't even think about leaving. Every year we would come to the end of the year and we're exhausted and I would think, I can't leave because that kid's going to be a senior. I, I got to be here for their senior year. And, you know, that team, we're going to go far next year. You know, we're going to, we've got a real shot next year. And I, I just couldn't, I couldn't leave. It was part of who I was. And leaving when I had my kids was extremely hard. So I took a, a little hiatus, probably longer than expected. And then in 2014, Terry Donahue reached out to me with another blessing. And she said, come on back. We want you to work with alumni. So I got to track down all of these wonderful former classmates and former students who were doing amazing things and reconnect. What a blessing. Um, I got to hear the stories. I got to tell the stories. And I got to learn about the history that came before me. You know, I got to meet the lovely woman who wrote the alma mater. And she came and sang it for the students. And that was so special to bring that to them. Now here I am working for the Felician sisters who I you know, couldn't imagine working for people I believe in more, that I respect more, that have given me more. You know, these are women who taught me what it was to be joyful in my faith. I don't know, even as a, an English person, I, I took me a long time to make that connection between Felician and Felicity. And there's joy here. Sister Melanie, with her, her clown face and her penny wars cheating and all of that, she brought joy. You know, I was lucky to have so many Felician sisters as teachers, as principals, as colleagues. Um, and this place has really shaped who I am. And so standing here now receiving this honor means the world to me. I am in such good company and humbled to be part of that company. And I hope to be connected to Osh forever. So thank you and congratulations to all of the award winners. Congratulations, Dina. The Olsh Distinguished Alumni Christian Leadership Award honors an Olsh alumnus who has distinguished themselves through community service, devotion to faith, or philanthropic efforts. At this time, I'd like to welcome John Gallagher to the podium to introduce Daniel Gallagher, Class of 2002, this year's Christian Leadership Award recipient. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. My name's John Gallagher, I'm Dan's brother. It is so nice to be back here and see all of you at this wonderful place. It feels like home, and that's because of people, especially like you and all of you. Congratulations to the other award winners as well. I'm honored to introduce my brother, Danny, as Our Lady of the Sacred Heart's next recipient of the Christian Leadership Award. My brother's faith development started at a really young age, of course, with our parents, Mike and Marlia, but also at our home parish, Holy Innocence Catholic Church in Sheridan, where our father and his father and his father before him knelt and prayed and worshiped and grew their families. Danny came to Our Lady of the Sacred Heart in 1998. This school was a vital, played a vital role and the man that my brother has become. It's where he learned how to be a leader. 
It's where he learned how to be an educator, how to be a man, and most importantly, it's where he learned how to be a man dedicated to Christ and Christ's will. There are many things about this place that are unique in developing leaders throughout our church. All of the faculty here, especially our principal at the time, Sister Francine, we're all better people because of you. But most importantly, at the center of this school, there's the Eucharist. At a time when so much is changing in your life and so many questions are unanswered, you could come at any time of the day in Eucharistic adoration and sit before the truth. It is there right behind us in those wall, chapel walls where I believe that my brother learned how to surrender his will to the Lord's. After graduating in 02, Dan went to Wheeling Jesuit University where he graduated summa cum laude with a degree in biology. Upon graduation of college, Danny sought out the Lord's will and he went down to Jamaica to a place called Mustard Seed Communities where he worked with children with disabilities and kids with AIDS, pregnant teenagers, and many more of the vulnerable. After he came home from there, he discerned the priesthood and joined the seminary. A few years after living in, in Rome, Dan came back home to Pittsburgh again not knowing what was gonna happen next. Until Central Catholic called him and they wanted him to be a religion teacher. And that just seemed like such a right fit. It seemed like that's where the Lord wanted him to be. And in that same year, he met his beautiful wife, Christina. They now have three children with the fourth on the way. Danny's a founder of an organization called Move a Mountain Missions. It's where they incorporate teaching Pittsburgh's teenagers with caring for the most vulnerable around us. He leads multiple mission trips to Jamaica every year to that same place where young adults develop a relationship with our Lord while they're serving the most vulnerable. There was a trip that I was delighted to be on. I, I think it was the first one that Danny led down uh, to Jamaica. And there was a in particular teenager who was going through a whole lot at the time, way more than a teenager should. And this teenager transformed before our very eyes. It was beautiful to see. And still to this day, now that teenager is an adult. They are still very, very involved in the church and dedicated to the Lord. And Danny led that teenager down and let the Lord do the rest. He does this often. He does this with hundreds and hundreds of students every year. In a world filled with wolves, Dan shows young adults, by his example, how to be sheep and how to follow and surrender to the Good Shepherd. I just recently asked one of his students, uh, what is the best thing Dan has ever taught you? His answer was simple. Mr. Gallagher taught me that the goal in life is not to make as much money as you possibly can, but instead the goal is to be a great man, to be a good father, to be a good husband, and that the real goal in life is to make it to heaven. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my brother, my best friend and hero, Daniel Gallagher. <laughs> Thank you, John. You stole a lot of my talk, so that's good. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to thank President Donahue, Mr. Plosnick, Phoebe Christek, in a particular way, Sister Francine, and all of the Felician sisters, for this award, but more for the many ways in which the Osh community has blessed me throughout my life. As I was entering into my senior year at OSH, I was very heavily recruited, not by college athletic programs that I would have hoped to be, but I was heavily recruited by Mrs. Hess, 
who wanted me to join the choir. We didn't have any male voices, very few male voices in the choir, so she was hard on the recruiting trail. She figured I had the right last name. Surely I'd be able to sing. She was surprisingly disappointed when she heard my voice. She had a fellow classmate, Tim Rosser. He ran the choir. She took me out into the auditorium and tried to teach me how to sing. And she said to me, she said, Dan, you have a beautiful voice. I wasn't expecting to hear that. She said, the problem is you have a very narrow range and you're rarely in it. But I thought that's a very sweet way to tell somebody they're a terrible singer. But she was being genuine, and I knew it, I knew it then, I know it now. She wasn't telling me that I'm a ter terrible singer. She was telling me, you have this incredible potential. You have this greatness within you, which can be unlocked. And I think, for me, that was the story of Osh again and again. And I know for so many of my classmates, for so many that have come through these halls, that was the story. You have this incredible potential. Let us help you to unlock it. It was those little conversations like that in between classes, words of challenge, words of encouragement from the teachers, that I think challenged me maybe more than what I've learned in the classrooms or in the sports fields. Those little moments that say, I know you, I know what you're going through, I love you, you matter. That there was knowledge of me and what I was going through in subtle ways that the teachers have pushed me along. As I thought back on my time at Osh, I thought of three great lessons that Osh taught me, that the community at Osh taught me that have stayed with me throughout my entire life. The first one was the value of hard work. I was not prepared for high school when I got here. I came from the West End. My first quarter was my worst academic performance, but I saw in my classmates this incredible work ethic. What I had on the, in, in sports, they carried that in the classroom, and they taught me about academic rigor. They challenged me in ways they don't know to pursue academic excellence. So I thank all of them, the teachers and the classmates that pushed me to work harder, to strive for excellence, to know that the difference between a 90% and a 97% is a whole lot of work. The second lesson that I learned from Walsh is to hate losing. I certainly did my fair share of it while I was here, whereas in basketball and baseball we won quite a few games. The same was not true of soccer. Mr. Plazic, no, and that's all right. I will say, following a 2-18 and 18 season in my sophomore year, we did have a bounce-back year where we won six games the following year. We lost nearly, I lost nearly 40 games as part of nearly 40 losses in my three years uh, where I played goalie for Osh. And I hated every one of them. Uh, I never got used to it. I never got used to looking behind me and seeing the ball in the net. My parents know that well. <laughs> they had to put up with me on those evenings after each, after each loss. Each, each of those games was, for me, a little tragedy. It was this little kind of, I was go, whatever else I was going through, it was this little tragedy. I'd recover the next day, but I hated losing. As I went through life, I learned that's a great thing, to hate losing those little tragedies, whenever I learned one of the most important lessons, that there's one great tragedy in life, and that tragedy is to not become a saint, to not give everything over to the Lord, to not trust in Him. That segues neatly into my third point, which Osh taught me 
to know the God who is love. When I was a sophomore, Sister Louise came on to WCHR. She made an announcement. I was doing homework. I don't know what she said. <laughs> she made an announcement, though, that we had Eucharistic adoration here, that it was available to the students. It was later that day, a good friend of mine, Bill Rust, we were in a study hall in the library, and he nudged me. He's like, hey, do you want to sign up for this adoration, this opportunity? He wanted to get out of study hall. Um, he liked that little bit of freedom he had in the, just the walk over. But for me, that changed my life. Kind of discovered, actually, it was in this room. This is with the sister's side of the chapel, but this is where we came to do Eucharistic adoration. I sat about where Mr. Hines is right now. And coming from the city, our bus always got here early, like 30 minutes before anybody else. And so I would oftentimes, daily actually, come and sit in the chapel before our Lord and I didn't know how to pray. But I would just stand there and sit there and just receive God's love. Just allow God to love me. As I grew up and matured in my faith, I realized that that same love which I experienced in this chapel was the same love that God has for everyone. And the great challenge of Christianity is to live out of that reality, to see other people the way that God sees them, with that same great love. Another experience that taught me to know the God who is love was on World Youth Days. Walsh presented me with this incredible opportunity to go to Rome the summer between my sophomore and junior year. And it was there where I saw a living saint, Pope John Paul II, it was there where I first experienced the universal church, seeing people, believers, young believers from all across the world, gathered together, united in our faith in Christ. It was also there while other pilgrims were flocking to St. Peter's Basilica, St. Paul outside the walls, the other major sites within Rome where we were led to this small chapel that few people knew about called Our Lady of the Sacred Heart. It's in Piazza Navona. You wouldn't know it's a church from the outside. But we went in there, obviously, because that's our patroness. And in there, I went to confession and had a, just a very genuine confession where I was able to get off a lot that was weighing me down and receive, in return, God's love and mercy. As John mentioned, I got to go back to Rome. I studied there for three years. And every day I walked through Piazza Navona on my way to class. Usually running. I was always running a little late. But on my way back, I'd stop in that same chapel every day and just offer a quick prayer stand before this beautiful icon of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart, reflect on God's love and the values that were nourished in me in these halls. I'm honored to receive this award on Christian leadership to be a Christian is to find reason to give thanks to God in every situation, to rejoice always, as St. Paul says, that even amidst the difficulties and trials, that God's joy breaks through that. To be Christian is also to have confidence that God's infinite love far outweighs the sum of our sins. I learned that in these halls, that God's, God's infinite love that he pours out on us. It's those experiences that have inspired me to try to bring that transforming love to others. John mentioned our first mission trip that he was able to come on. 
and some of the transformations that took place that led us to continue it and to try to increase it. Last year, we were slated to take over 100 high school students down to Mustard Seed Communities, a home for abandoned children with disabilities. But that first trip, it could have very easily never happened. That was when the Zika virus was going on. My wife, Christina, was pregnant with our firstborn. So we were kind of, you know, there were a lot of unknowns. And I remember talking with her about it. She just said, just, just have to trust in God. You've planned this. Take the precautions and let's trust in, trust in God. She could have very easily said, you're not going. It's too, it's too dangerous. But she was so generous and so self-sacrificial. And so I thank her for all of those small self-sacrifices that she does every day, raising our three little children, the small sacrifices she makes that make it possible for me to do the mission work that I love doing so much. As I think back on my time at Osh, those lessons of hard work, of hating to lose, and of knowing the God who is love, it stays with me every day and continues to drive me to try to bring God's love, God's peace, God's joy into a world which so desperately needs it. Thank you all. Congratulations, Dan. The Olsh Distinguished Alumni Professional Excellence Award honors an Olsh alumnus who has distinguished themselves in their profession. At this time, I would like to welcome William Stickman to the podium to introduce Michael Kavik, Olsh Class of 1998, our Professional Excellence Award recipient. <laughs> Good to be back, and it's good to see so many friendly faces in the room. Um, coming back to Olsh is always, I think, a treat, an honor, a homecoming. But especially today, when I have the honor and the privilege and the opportunity to introduce for our Distinguished Alumni Professional Excellence Award my very best friend, Mike Kavik. Mike and I met here at Olsh 26 years ago as freshmen up in Tom Briding's English class on our first week of school. And since that time, I've gotten to know Mike, not just as an excellent professional, as a distinguished, internationally recognized scientist, but as a person, as a dedicated son, brother, husband, father, as a dedicated friend, as a man of many interests, a true Renaissance man, as Mr. Mahalo used to ad advocate we become, and also as a Christian, an Orthodox Christian, with a deep faith. And one of the highlights of my life was last year going on a pilgrimage with Mike to the Holy Land and to walk in the sacred spaces where our Lord walked. Uh, but beyond our friendship, I'm honored to be here to introduce Mike as a supporter of Olsh, as a fellow member of the class of 1998, objectively the best class in Olsh history, um, as a former member of the board, and most of all, and most proudly now for me, as an Olsh parent, as the parent of one of our freshmen in the class of 2024. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do this, to give Mike this award for his excellence in science, because as an advocate for Catholic education, you frequently hear the, the prejudice the Catholic schools are really good at the humanities, but man, they lag behind in STEM. And that's wrong, wrong, wrong. And we who love Olsh and what the programs Olsh has across the board in academics, uh, we that believe in its mission and its strength in all fields, including the sciences, are very happy to hold Mike out as an example to current students 
and most importantly, to future students. So Mike, I, I, I tried to learn as much about him as I could, more so about his professional life, because I know about his personal life. So he gave me his resume. Uh, I mean, I studied ancient languages, but there were terms in there that I can't even figure out. And I talked to him about how he became the person in science that he is now. And I think that it all began as a young child on his farm in Beaver County, looking up with wonder at the night sky, seeing the stars, wondering what lies beyond those stars, looking at his telescope and his observatory that he showed me the first time we went down there, along with a sports car and a neat video game, um, and watching Star Trek. And it, it was because of Star Trek that we started talking. He saw that I was reading a Star Trek novel, I confess. And he said, you're interested in Star Trek. Well, you know, I'm going to be a physicist someday. And because you're interested in Star Trek, it must follow, therefore, that you'll want to read these books that, that I like to read. And he recommended to me Hyperspace, a journey through parallel universes, time warps in the 10th dimension by Professor Michio Kaku. And another nice bedtime reading, uh, The Brief History of Time by Professor Hawking. Now, needless to say, Mike's um, enthusiasm didn't necessarily pay off in my life, but I was pleased to see it flourish and bear fruit in his life. I remember the day that Mike said to me, I am going to be a physicist someday, and I am going to formulate the theory of everything. The theory of everything. And now remember, this is as freshmen here in these halls, the theory of everything. I said, well, Mike, what's that? And he explained, well, you know, Bill, we have a bunch of different fundamental theories. There's the really big, the, astrophys the astrophysical, astronomy, general relativity. And then there's the really small. What lies not in an atom, but the things that are small, far smaller than that? Uh, quantum mechanics. And he says, you know, there's, there is, if we work hard enough, an answer that ties all of these things together, and it will explain everything. I said, wow, that's great, Mike. Um, now, Mike was serious, though. He had, a no, he had this, this famous, maybe infamous green book bag that was misplaced throughout the school dozens of times in any given day, along with keys and wallets and things like that. And in this green book bag was a notebook. And in this notebook that Mike had were his notes were his questions that would pop into his mind. And I'm gonna explain later why the questions are the most important part for what Mike does. And then Mike's solutions to these and some equations and some sketches and some lists of things that he needed to do. Remember my book bag, keys and wallet. Um, but this was a serious student. It was a serious student that graduated from Olsh and moved on to the University of Minnesota at Minneapolis. And pursued not one, but two bachelors of science. Um, and there, I remember Mike calling me on the phone as we're both adjusting to a new academic community and the rigors of college. And he said, you know, Bill, it's actually pretty easy. Not only was Mr. Clark a better math teacher than I have here, and Mr. Mahalo a better science teacher, but we actually use the same textbooks for calculus and physics that we used at Olsh. And that's a very serious, internationally recognized program. And Mike is a gift with, with, with words, too. He could have been a politician had he taken another path. As an undergraduate, Mike convinced his professors to let him be part as an active researcher in not one, not two, but three separate research projects, graduate-level research projects, I guess postgraduate level, that they were working on in high energy theory and in astrophysical theory. So following Minnesota, Mike went to his, um, get his master's degree in science at the University of Chapel Hill, uh, in North, North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And then he studied for his PhD in not one, but two world-renowned universities. First at the US, uh, University of Southern California, USC. And these were great places to go and visit him, by the way, uh, at USC in LA. And that's where, most importantly, he met his wonderful wife, Bing, who herself is a, has a PhD in physics and works as a quantitative analyst at Goldman Sachs. Those are good genes in those kids over there. Um, and then he finished his PhD, including a good deal of research at Virginia Tech, where he earned his uh, PhD with a doctoral thesis, which was entitled Quantum Gravity and Astronom Astronomical Phenomena. 
Since graduation, Mike has served as a professor in three universities, um, the College of New Jersey, Long Island University's Brooklyn campus, and now for the State University of New York um, on Long Island's, uh, the, the campus there. Uh, and you know, Mike has bridged a lot of different gaps. And some people think that those who are great researchers aren't necessarily the best teachers. But that's not the truth for Mike. I went on to a very authoritative source, ratemyprofessor.com, and, and saw what students say about Mike. Professor Kavik is truly an ideal professor. He's thorough with every topic and makes the information very accessible. I have never taken physics before and was incredibly nervous, but he almost makes it difficult to fail. His teaching style makes any concept very easy to grasp, whether you know physics or not, and most importantly, he gives very easy extra credit. So Mike inspires students. In fact, his resume shows that 29 students have sought Mike's mentorship on their academic research. An academic pedigree, and I believe Mike's goes back to Heisenberg himself, an academic pedigree is very important in the scientific field, and he serves as a mentor to tomorrow's scientists that will take up the questions that he asks now and keep going with them. Mike has found time to speak. He has spoken at 41 different uh, international conferences, national conferences, about topics relating to physics. He has published 23 papers uh, highlighting the research that Mike has engaged in. And some of the titles, for your interest, are Shining Light on Quantum Gravity with Pulsar, Pulsar Black Hole Binaries, Constraining the Rate of Primordial Black Hole Explosions, and Extra Dimensional Scale Using a Low Frequency Radio Antenna Array. And finally, Transient Astrophysical Pulses from Exploding Primordial Black Holes as signature of an extra dimension. Now, Mike's research, especially the one where they observed two colliding pulsars in space and looked at what that meant for various astrophysical and quantum theories, have received not only international recognition in the scientific community, but also in the popular media. I remember reading on Fox News with a great illustration of the two pulsars colliding and saying, that's Mike's work he's working on right there. So this is big deal stuff that he's working on. But what's a bigger deal, perhaps, is that Mike serves as a link between two different fields in the scientific community. He explained to me that very early in his time in academia, he realized that the folks that worked in quantum, the small, very rarely ever talked with the folks that worked in the astrophysical. And those that worked in theory didn't often communicate with those who work in observation. And he said the reason for this, he discovered, was not scientific. It was sociological. They just didn't talk. So Mike's research and his scientific expertise bridges those gaps and links those chains together. That's what makes Mike's work so significant in the scientific community, because they're able to test with what we can see using instruments like a large radio telescope in Africa and particle accelerators, the theories that Mike is also very strongly versed in. It allows them to use the best that we have now to answer the questions that we have about how the universe works and pose more questions for the future. But knowing Mike and knowing and talking with him throughout the years, I also think that Mike serves as an example, the Renaissance man that Mr. Mahalu talked about, of another big gap between science and science as it's sometimes misportrayed as the repository of the, the secrets of the universe. Scientists say, or in this house we believe in science. Well, what does that mean? Well, Mike says that's not really science. Popular view of science isn't someone that has all the answers to every problem that we have. A scientist has the questions. That goes back to his notebook. And the questions are what's important, because it's the questions that guide us toward the answers. And ultimately, those answers are more questions. And what's the end of this? The end of this is truth, with a capital T. Mike's view of science is what the classical philosophers would call scientia, which is knowledge which itself works toward philosophia, an understanding of wisdom, wisdom itself. And Mike's explained to me many times his interest in looking at the human condition 
and how science has been part of the human condition because curiosity is. It's curiosity that led people eons ago to ask, what's over there in the next valley? Can we make our own fire? Can people fly like birds? What's beyond the seas? Can sons and daughters of the earth stand on the moon and maybe beyond? Uh, can we observe gravitational wave sources with flexible wide arc radio transient surveys? One of his papers. Do exploding black holes give us a glimpse of another direction in time? And what be lies beyond time and space itself? And most importantly, what does that mean? Mike has these questions. and He's doing his best in his career to answer these questions. And the answers to the questions that he's asking now will frame the questions that the next generation of scientists will try to answer. Men and women who might now be sitting here like Mike was 26 years ago at Olsh, working with the science teachers here now. Men and women who, like Mike, looked up to the night sky one time and was filled with wonder, and like Mike does, proclaims like the prophet David, that the heavens themselves declared the glory of God, and the firmament shows forth his handiwork. Men and women who will join Mike as the next link in the chain by pressing toward the ever-receding horizons of human knowledge, by learning the mysteries of creation, and in so doing, gives us insight into the author of creation, the creator himself. Mike's work is important. It's important to us as a school, it's important to us as a community of Osh alumni, and it's important to us in the human community. And I am honored and humbled, Mike, to introduce you today to, to take this award, which is well-deserved, as an Osh alum, but most importantly, my best friend. I'm really overwhelmed by that speech. I, I didn't know what he was going to say. He asked me a bunch of weird questions, and uh, I answered them, and that was it. That was fantastic. Thank you, Bill. Um, Bill and I have been friends, as he said, for the better part of a quarter century. How's that make you feel? <laughs> we're, both, uh, we're both over 40. It's, uh, it's rough. Um, well, it's funny that you referenced Star Trek. I was going to do that, too. When Bill and I um, were both at Olsh, uh, and, a, and the real focus of my speech, uh, as the amazing teachers at this institution, uh, truly unbelievable. One of those great teachers uh, who shall remain uh, nameless, <coughs> Finnegan, Mr. Finnegan, uh, came in one day. And uh, we were sitting in, in Latin class. And he asked, he had, it was great for asking philosophic questions. And he said, you know, what, what does it mean to be a friend? What, what does that mean? Bill, as I would imagine you can tell from his speech, very studious, very careful, likes to get the right answer. And uh, he very carefully took down the answer, which was, a friend is someone who leads you to virtue. Wonderful definition, wonderful answer. I uh, wrote that down, we both remembered it. Uh, Mr. Finnegan came in, I think it was like two days later, and said, uh, what does it mean to be a friend? And we, of course, assumed, you know, he's, uh, he's testing us. He gave us the answer, and we wanted to see if we were paying attention. Bill piped up before I even had a chance to speak. I know you're shocked to hear that. Uh, and he said, a, a friend is someone who leads you to virtue. And uh, Mr. Finnegan said, you're wrong, Mr. Stickman. <laughs> we were all shocked. And he said, a friend is someone who is uncommon, a friend is someone who isn't a friend to everyone. Uh, they have uncommon uh, qualities that, that you recognize that tie you together. And so Bill got it wrong, and he was crestfallen. You were wrong that day, Bill, but I'll tell you, you passed both of those tests. You have true moral courage, um, and you have led me in so many ways to virtue, and I'm so grateful for it. Um, by the way, Mr. Finnegan, who I know is watching, just unfriended me on Facebook. <laughs> um, I want to start uh, by, by thanking a lot of people. Um, uh, President Donahue, um, of course, Sister Francine, um, 
uh, principal Plostnik. It's going to take a little getting used to. Uh, uh, Mr. Plostnik was one of the fantastic teachers that I had that taught me the underpinnings of our, of our government and our society, and I'm so grateful for that. Um, uh, to, to Phoebe and also to, to Dina, who was reaching out as an alumni years ago, and uh, of course to the other award winners. Uh, congratulations to you all, and, and thank you so much for this, uh, this fantastic honor. I also want to thank my family, um, my sister Chris, who's in Las Vegas, uh, but is watching online, my nephew Anthony, who's also watching, and here with, uh, with us today, um, my, my dear mother, my lovely, wonderful wife, um, not going to cry, uh, and, and um, of all the accomplishments uh, that, that Bill outlined uh, so, so nicely, the accomplishment I'm the most proud of is being a dad uh, to John and Samantha who are with us here. Uh, Daddy loves you. Um, and th it, without you, without your support, I, I wouldn't be able to accomplish a thing, truly. Um, in the Our Father, in the Our Father, uh, Jesus taught us to ask God for our daily bread, our daily needs. We are lucky, truly lucky, deeply fortunate, if we can have our daily needs met. Most human beings on the earth today and throughout history have had to struggle simply to survive, to have food to eat, to have a place to stay. If, if you have your daily needs met, you should be eternally grateful, and I am. If you, I am one of the luckiest people you will ever meet because beyond just having my daily needs met, I've had the opportunity to live my dreams. I've had the opportunity to do what provides me the deepest meaning for, for my career and to be paid for it. Uh, I tell my students very often, and I always, always tell them, don't tell the administrators this, <laughs> that I would do my job for free. Uh, I, I have derived such an immense amount of joy from, from teaching the students and from getting to ask the questions that I get to ask. Um, and I think the question I really want to ask and answer with you today is what allowed me to, to get to that very high state where I can not just survive, but, but reach out and, and actually touch and, and grab hold of my dreams. And, it, and in, there's many different things. But one of the most essential things is my education. It is education in our world, which is the great differentiator, it is the thing that allows you to step up and grab hold of your dreams and pull, pull those dreams down and make them a reality. And that ability was given to me here at Olsh. Um, and I want to talk to you about that and what that experience is about, but I want to give you a one brief example of what the power of education really is. Our Lord Jesus Christ was born a poor Jew in a conquered province in a town that was so obscure and out of the way, they literally lived in caves. As Bill mentioned, we've had the deep honor to stand in those caves uh, at the place of the Annunciation, and I've seen it. He was executed by one of the largest, most powerful political entities the world has ever seen. And in 300 years, that same empire declared its official religion, the worship of that man, the man that they executed. If that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. Most people associate with that event, the conversion of the Emperor Constantine, certainly an important event, no doubt. But there's part of the story that you may not have heard, part of the story you might not know. The early Christian church, continuing to this day, took all comers, universally, democratically. You could be a slave, you could be a woman, it didn't matter. You could come to the church and learn about the faith, but get other things, get an education, be taught to read. And over the course of years in uh, the, the Roman Empire, the people who were taught by the Christian community to read became scribes and became administrators that were spread throughout the empire. The empire was converted to Christianity through love and education. 
One of the most amazing acts, one of the most amazing conquests was done without a sword, without a battle, but through love and knowledge. And I think it's very important that we bear that in mind and that we know that Olsh carries on that tradition today. Um, when I was in fifth grade, I, uh, I had a teacher who was not at Olsh yet. Her name was Mrs. Reinich, not the Mrs. Reinich that taught here, never had her. It was her mother, believe it or not. And I don't know why she said this. It was in social studies class, and she said to us, someone asked her, why do you want to be a teacher? Because we were all talking, it was like, what do you, you know, when you're a kid, they always ask you, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, well, Miss French, why do you want to be a teacher? Why did you do that? And she said, you don't know it, and you don't see it, but there are moments when you're trying to learn something, and it finally breaks through. And I can actually, this is her talking, she said, I can actually see the light bulb go off over your head. And that, and she said, that those moments are, are, feel amazing, they're priceless. I was in fifth grade, and I thought that was one of the stupidest things that I had ever heard. I thought, who cares about light bulbs, and why, what does that have to do with your job? And I'm here to tell you, I, I, one of the great honors of my life is to be an educator, and it is exactly right. That moment, when the knowledge breaks through and you are in there, in the room, and you see it happen, it's priceless. And, and that is what good teaching is. Good teaching is fundamentally about care and respect for your students, and that is what I got here from so many different, so many different educators. When I first sat down to write this speech, I was going to say, that I would not have been able to achieve a lot of these important scientific achievements that Bill tried to outline. Don't know how important they are. And I thought, no, no, it's deeper than that. Literally every time I write an email, I use some rule that Mr. Briding taught me. I'm gonna give you a long list of teachers, so you better be ready for that one. So it's just one example. Every time I go about my daily life, the way that I view life, the way I think about life, the way I express myself, how I'm speaking to you now, were, were things that I learned and were taught here. And I thought, no, it's even deeper than that. I couldn't have written this speech. <laughs> I used the knowledge and the tools that I were taught here to do this. I couldn't even get through this without what I learned at Olsh. It's unbelievable. It's had such an incredible impact, and I'm so deeply grateful. I'm going to uh, go through a list now. And I'm going to name some teachers. I don't want you to think it's exhaustive. It's not. It's not in any particular order. Um, but I just want to recognize some people and say their names and tell you what those things are. Some of the examples of the things that I learned that get me through my day. Every day, including this one. Mr. Finnegan, as I mentioned to you, taught us Latin and what it is to be a friend. Um, but he did much more. Mr. Finnegan taught me, and I hope he's watching now, I think he is. Mr. Finnegan taught me that whether you know it or not, you walk around with a philosophy in your everyday life, even if you don't think about it, even if you don't realize it. The only difference is if it's an examined philosophy or not, if it's a considered philosophy or it's one of convenience. I never forgot that. He also taught me the power of a good sweater vest. I gotta tell you, as a professor, you can't beat it. Never want a professor in a suit, honestly. So they tell me. Mr. Brasco, my goodness, uh, if you aren't one of the best people on the face of the earth, I don't know who is. You are an endless well of goodness, of mirth, of joy. You taught me to love history. Do you know what he did the first day of history class? Taught me to love classic rock. He pulled out Time by Pink Floyd and he played it. To this day, you're smiling because you know it too. It was the first day. First day, he played Time by Pink Floyd, and when that song comes on the radio to this day, I get chills. It's an amazing human being. Mr. Briding, these words that I'm saying now, the ability to express myself with clarity and forcefulness, he taught me. He's a professional musician. He knows how to do it for real, out in the real world. He knows how to express himself for a living. He taught me to never use the word very, ever. Don't ever say, I think. If you're making a declarative statement, they know that you think that. Don't use the same word twice. 
don't use five words when two words will do. I don't know if this speech really obeyed that particular rule, Mr. Broding. Sorry about that. Um, uh, you were right about everything when it came to the expression of language, except Slaughterhouse-Five. I don't know what you were thinking. That book is terrible. It's depressing. Mr. Uh, okay, Mr. Broding, that book is awful. Uh, also, Mr. Broding just unfriended me. Mr. M, what can I say about Mr. M? So caring, he viewed us and treated us as his own children. Here's the thing, I'm a professional scientist and, and I can tell you, Bill, everything Bill said was right. Freshman year of college, I was ready. Minnesota's physics program was no joke. I, 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 had, I had no problems. He prepared us the way a professional prepares you. He lived the life as an engineer. He had me ready. He set me on the course for my future. Mr. M, I can never thank you enough. Mr. Clark, our universe is written in the language of mathematics. Mr. Clark opened the door to advanced mathematics for me. One of the most fantastic mathematics teachers I've ever seen. Ms. Mancuso, taught me to play the guitar, to play the piano. The joy of that music lives in me today. It is a torture for my family who has to listen to me, actually sing, but for me, it is a great joy. And she taught me something else. She taught me to face challenges in life, darkness with happiness, with joy, with light, to face dark times with light. Thank you, Mr. Crossan. This one's a tall order, and I mean it when I say it. That man taught me the meaning of life. He taught me to understand meaning in life, to be able to define the dimensions of, of what meaning is, what the nature of our existence is, what the nature of our God is. He also gave me a tie. Thank you for the tie, Mr. Crossan. Taught me to love uh, the Beatles. He taught me to love Bob Dylan. You were right about both of those. You were wrong about Pepsi. Pepsi is terrible, and stop drinking so many Pepsis. It's not good for you. He also unfriended me just now. There's, there's two more on my list, and these are people who have passed on. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's obviously very special to remember them and, and remember the, the great things that they taught me. Debbie Mendoza was my theater coach. She taught me how to act, how to speak, how to breathe. But she taught me so much more. She taught me to understand human nature and what motivates our actions, what motivates us to do the things that we do and how we can use drama and theater to show that to other people. She gave me the ability, when I stand in front of a class, to speak, to convey complicated ideas, difficult concepts. She knew nothing about physics, but she's allowed me to communicate physics to hundreds and hundreds of students. And Sister Louise. Sister Louise um, taught me to see Christ in everyone. And when I was with her, I could see the face of Christ every time I spoke to her. Sorry, it's, it's difficult. She was truly Christ to me. I have had the ability to explore my dreams, and I wish I could tell you. I wish I could give to you the experience of what it is like to look at the universe, to experience the universe on its deepest level, that feeling of awe, that feeling of wonder. I wish that for all of you. I have had the ability to see and discover new things. I wish I could convey that to you as well. The feeling of seeing something for the first time that no human being has ever seen before, that exists on the other side of the universe. That thrill of discovery is unparalleled. And I was able to reach that because I was put on the shoulders of the teachers here at Olsch, and I was able to reach up and pull that dream down into my life. Each of you gave me a thread that allowed me to weave the tapestry of my life, and I will be forever grateful. Thank you.
Congratulations, Michael. Please join me one more time in a round of applause for Haley, Dina, Daniel, Michael, and all others who were nominated for awards. At this time, I'd like to welcome Sister Francine to lead us in singing the Olsh Alma Mater. If you need a refresher, it can be found in your event programs at your seats. Please join me in singing. <clears throat> Across the hills and valleys resounds this blessed name of Mary, Queen and Mother, whose virtues we proclaim to follow her example is something we wish to do. So listen, lovely maiden, we dedicate this song to you. Dear lady of our high school, we pledge our loyalty to follow your example of truth and purity. Through all the years ahead of us, we never wish to part from you, our leader and our patron, our Lady of the Sacred Heart, our Lady of the Sacred Heart. Looks like choir paid off for the Gallagher brothers, because I noticed you all had that memorized. <laughs> I'd like to extend my deepest gratitude to all of you for being here today. Um, some of you did come quite far to celebrate with us. And I'm very grateful that you did. Um, I said I wasn't going to make any pop culture references, but I just can't help myself. <laughs> I shared with the Olsh class of 2020 at their commencement ceremony over the summer that I want them to always think of Olsh as the place where everybody knows your name and they're always glad you came. I think that one went way over their heads, but hopefully it didn't go over yours. Please, that extends to all of you as well. Always think of Olsh as your home and know that you are always welcomed back here. I encourage you to be involved in other school events and future awards ceremonies, either through attending the event or serving as a committee member or even by nominating other deserving alumni for awards. That invitation to nominate Olsh alumni extends to everybody here and everybody at home. If at any point you think of another alumnus who embodies the characteristics attributed to one of the awards you heard about here today, please share that with us. We are extremely grateful for those who nominated these four wonderful honorees today for believing in them so much and wanting to see their accomplishments be recognized. Thank you all for coming and for tuning in. It was lovely celebrating with you all, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you.